Good morning. Good morning. Am I in the light? Thank you. I need my light. So, good morning. My name is Sylvia Day, and I am a comedian based in Zurich, and somebody was just saying to me earlier today, Switzerland has comedians, and uh, that's why I'm here. It's my mission in life. Um, I call it entertaining the troops because uh, I entertain the expat international community, and they really need to laugh because, uh, yeah. So I'm so honored and thrilled to be here today among so many brilliant minds and souls. Um, like so many of you, this is a cause that means a lot to me. Uh, my mother has dementia, um, but she still has her sense of humor and her wisdom. In fact, uh, I called her the other day to tell her about um, my ambassadorship with the Women's Brain Project, and I said, by the way, this, this doesn't mean anything as a phone anymore, have you noticed? <laughs> You show this to a millennial, they would have no idea what this was. Um, so I called her the other day. <laughs> Actually, I, was, I put her on speaker and I was, I was working. Uh, no, I called her and I said, Mom, did you know that uh, more women suffer from brain and mental health disorders than men? And she said, she's Brazilian, by the way, she said, I told you, it's because men drive women crazy. <laughs> so she'll be very pleased to know that there's now scientific proof to back that theory. So, um, just a few housekeeping things before we go on to the first keynote speaker. Um, if you want a live tweet, please do. And the name is hashtag women's brains. Is that correct? Hashtag women's brains. Okay, so I'm very, very honored to introduce our first keynote speaker today. She is a Columbia University trained public health specialist. Kalia is her name. She is the youngest expert on the World Economic Forum's Council on the Future of Health and Healthcare. She is also a former Peace Corps volunteer and winner of both the Middleton Candler Peace Prize and the 2017 Claire Booth Luce Award for International Service. Kalia has had her opinion pieces on emerging drug therapies published in both Wire Duck magazine and the New York Times and is currently working on a book about the future of mental health. And by the way, she's also a princess, so she can attest to Maria Therese's story that you heard earlier. Please welcome Kalia. Hi. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Sylvia. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and a privilege to be here today. I will preface this in advance by saying the opinions in my talk are entirely my own uh, and do not necessarily reflect that of the conference as a whole. And I say that not because they asked me to or because what I'm about to say is anything disagreeable, but rather that my commentary is personal from me to you, and in the context of, uh, sorry, from me to you, and in the context of looking towards a bright future for brain and mental health for all. So you may be asking yourselves, why does sex and gender matter? To explain, let me start with a story. When I was little, my mom asked me to draw what I wanted to be when I grew up. Never someone short of imagination, I drew her not one, but three things that I wanted to be. A fireman, a ballerina, and a psychologist. I grew up in a very progressive house where parents didn't want me to feel like my identity was dictated by societal norms, such as girls are ballerinas and boys are firemen. So whenever I was given toys, it was always both. So different parts of me wanted to be the strong fireman, the graceful ballerina, and the person who heals people by listening. My mom was a psychologist, and I was always impressed and in awe of the fact that people would come to her to get better, that she was, in her own way, saving the world one person at a time, one individual at a time, through listening and asking the right questions. Now, I never did end up being a ballerina, which is obvious if any of you have ever seen me dance. But I did end up becoming, in some ways, both a psychologist and a firefighter of sorts. 
I got a degree in public health and used it to listen to and ask the right questions about epidemics of illness. And right now, it is epidemics of mental health issues that are reaching global proportions, growing like an out-of-control fire in desperate need of some firefighters to put it out. Depression is now the leading cause of disability worldwide, according to the WHO. Over 300 million people are estimated to suffer from depression, and between almost a million a year commit suicide. And between 2010 and 2050, the cumulative global economic output associated with mental health is projected to be 16 trillion US dollars, approximately the same amount as the entire US GDP. In fact, in this room, it is statistically probable that one in 10 of you are on some sort of antidepressant, and that one out of every four of you will suffer from a mental illness at some point in your lives. As the writer Rita Mae Brown once said, take a look at your three best friends. If they're OK, then it's you. <laughs> but seriously, everyone in this room is in some way affected by mental health or brain health issues themselves or via a loved one. Every year, 15 million people suffer a stroke of which 6 million die and 5 million are left permanently disabled. It is the second leading cause of death. And dementia is skyrocketing. There were an estimated 47 million people living with dementia in 2015, and this number is expected to double every 20 years, reaching 75 million in 2030 and 130 million people in 2050, if nothing is done. To give you some perspective on that figure, that is more people than in all of Japan. And addiction is on the rise. 80% of the global opiate supply is consumed in the United States, where painkillers are a $24 billion market. And what are two of the top three highest consumed drugs? Painkillers and antidepressants. Prescription opiate sales and overdose, overdose deaths are up 400% in the last 10 years. And on average, one in three women will be the victim of sexual assault. We are talking one every two minutes, or seven by the time my talk is over. 13% of these rape victims attempt suicide, and many of them are left with PTSD. And among many of the refugee populations and victims of war, they recently had to coin a new term to describe the severity of the mental distress experienced because they felt PTSD did not appropriately describe the brain's reaction to seeing parents killed, homes destroyed, and streets strewn with bodies. Women are often the hardest hit by these mental health issues. It is estimated that 80% of the 50 million people currently affected by violent conflicts, civil wars, disasters, and displacement are women and children. And on the more safe turf, such as the US, while one in three Americans will struggle with a mental illness, this figure is 40% higher in women. Women in general are twice as likely to experience clinical depression. They are also two times as likely to develop PTSD as men. There are some theories for what we dub the depression gap, hormones, social pressures, and most significantly, the fact that women experience vastly higher levels of violence and abuse, as evidenced by some of the staggering rape statistics I mentioned earlier. So what can we do? And how can we help? Many of the factors that make women more vulnerable are environmentally or socially constructed. And some, too, may be biological. But looking at it more simply, as in the metaphor of the fire, there are some simple practices to putting out a fire. One, find a tool that can put it out, such as a hose that squirts water. And two, find out why the fire started, so you can start, stop it from starting again. So how can we apply this to women's brain and mental health? Well, firstly, to put out the fire of this epidemic, we need to look at the tools that we are using, because you can't put out a fire with a hose full of air. In this instance, not only do we need to dive deeper and do more appropriately constructed clinical trials to tease out treatment response differences in sex and gender, but further, I think we need to re-examine some of our fundamental theories on what does and does not work with respect to mental health and expand our clinical trials on a greater scale to new and emerging tools. 
We need to figure out where we can stop fires before they start by lowering the overall rates of depression and suffering in our midst. Pain begets pain. When a mother is depressed, the child suffers, the family suffers. Similarly, when a male is depressed or mentally unwell, he is more likely to engage in antisocial behaviors such as violence, domestic abuse, and substance use, which disproportionately affects females in turn, and also can lead, but also can lead to a tearing of society's very fabric, such as incidents of mass violence, which is almost exclusively perpetrated by males. But is simply another way, like depression, of manifesting an underlying mental injury. I use the term mental injury quite specifically here because I believe most people that are currently seen as mentally ill are actually just injured. All they need is the chance to heal with the right tools so that it is no longer something chronic. Other way, in both cases, by not putting out the fire where it starts, at the individual level, the fire grows and impacts the collective. People left to suffer untreated or poorly palliated become reservoirs and vectors of illness in our midst, not because they want to be, but because they can't seem to put out their own fires, and we, so far, have been unable to help them. Why? Well, because many of the tools we currently employ simply aren't working. Recently, there was a review, a review of 38 clinical trials comparing various treatments for depression. What the review found out was that placebos were three times as effective as no treatment, especially and more so if they had side effects, which is, in some ways, great. But, and here's the interesting part, antidepressants worked only marginally better. In fact, placebos were 75% as effective as prescription antidepressants. Diving deeper into unpublished FDA clinical trials, the review, conducted by Irving Kirsch, examined the six most widely used antidepressant drugs between 1987 and 1999, i.e. Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Celexa, Serzone, and Effexor, and found that placebos were actually 82% as effective as the drugs when measured along, uh, by the Hamilton Depression Scale, also known as the HAMD. The average difference on the HAMD was only 1.8 points, which, while statistically significant, is clinically meaningless. Which explains why, even as drug treatment for mental illness has exploded, so too have epidemics of mental health risen in concert. Our hose, quite simply, is not putting out the fire. But does that mean that we might as well be using placebos? Or is there something else, something that actually works, that we could use? I believe the answer is that there is. And that is not only the reason why I'm here speaking to you today, but it is also the how. Because I too was once debilitated by a mental injury. I had been the victim of a violent robbery that left me shattered. Nightmares, cold sweats, panic attacks. Literally overnight I went from a strong, vivacious woman to a broken version of myself. And this lasted for several years. It wasn't obvious on the outside. I was pretty good at hiding it. But no matter what I did, I just couldn't shake it. It was like I had contracted a virus with no cure and no hope for relief. I tried everything, all of the regularly prescribed drugs, talk therapy, exercise therapy, meditation, you name it. But I simply could not get back to the way I had been. And then I found out about some interesting research they were doing using a class of drugs that had once been seen as a promising class of compounds, but that had become not just stigmatized, but criminalized for decades, psychedelics. Now, for those of you not familiar with the term, a psychedelic is, loosely defined, anything that alters perception. In this case, I'm referring to things like MDMA, also known as ecstasy or molly, LSD, commonly known as acid, ketamine, K, uh, and psilocybin, also known as magic mushrooms. It sounds crazy, this idea of using such powerful compounds on people suffering from mental issues. It makes it so easy to dismiss. And any of you that are out there that are skeptical, I know how hardwired we are to think that these compounds are nothing but trouble, literally playing with fire rather than putting out the fire. 
But I'm here as living proof to tell you that these treatments work. When I decided to try to take my, my health in my own hands, I did so out of desperation and frustration, and I knew I was taking a risk. But I also had seen with my own eyes people utterly transformed in a positive way when it was done according to the proper protocols. And as both a scientist and a sufferer, I had to see what it was all about. I had to see if it would work. And it did. So well, in fact, that I rarely, if ever, suffer any of the symptoms of PTSD that I used to have on a daily basis. Quite simply, it saved my life. And psychedelics properly used have the potential to save the lives of countless others. Why? Because psychedelics do something that our current go-to psychiatric drugs cannot, transforming hardwired neural patterns to reroute the very architecture of the brain, sometimes in a single dose. Roland Griffiths, a professor of the, in the departments of psychiatry and neurosciences at John Hopkins, has likened psychedelics' ability to bring about what I call neural rerouting as akin to a surgical invent, intervention. Similarly, it is said that a single dose of psilocybin, the compound in magic mushrooms, can do in 30 seconds what it takes antidepressants three to four weeks to do, according to David Nutt, professor of neuro neuropharmacology at Imperial College London. And a study published in the Journal of Psychopharmacology on people with anxiety associated with life-threatening illness suggested that LSD-assisted psychotherapy was successful in almost 70% of subjects, with the positive effects lasting more than a year and causing no adverse reactions. And then there's MDMA, which just this year received breakthrough therapy status from the FDA for the treatment of PTSD, which is what I had. Breakthrough status essentially means that combined with a regimen of therapy, it can potentially do what no other drug on the market is capable of doing. And in this case as well, the numbers speak for themselves. The most recent batch of trials was on people with PTSD so severe that they'd been suffering with the condition for, for more than 17 years on average. 17 years. And the studies showed that when MDMA was used as part of a psychotherapy treatment, the effect was game-changing. One year after treatment, seven out of 10 of the people no longer suffered from this condition. By comparison, only two out of 10 people with PTSD find relief, not healing, but relief, from traditional psychotherapy and or psychiatric medications. But MDMA-assisted psychotherapy appears not only to provide short-term relief, but to promote such long-lasting changes in the brain that some patients are actually, in effect, cured, like me. For sure, these are early results with small sample sizes, but clearly we are onto something and this is just the beginning. There are so many things that contribute to ep epidemics of illness and tackling the issues of sex and gender and science are clearly things that we must do for the sake of science. But for the sake of humanity, I urge you all to consider that changing the norms that perpetuate violence, especially against women, and the norms that allow the festering of mental issues unabated. That is one of the things that we need to do if we are to address this epidemic. Because one small fire can quickly become a bigger one, but if we can actually heal mental injuries, one by one, individual by individual, we can be both the fireman and the psychoanalyst and keep the fire from growing out of control. Everyone here has the power to change this dynamic and open up new productive fields of inquiry. It doesn't have to be psychedelics, but we definitely need some new tools. Please help me find them, so maybe one day we won't all have to be psychoanalysts and firefighters, for there will be less fires to fight and less people needing help. And then, maybe then, we can all learn to dance instead. Thank you.